So now that Isle of Madness is out, I wanted to do a video specifically on the dual cards because we know what all of the dual cards are now. It's a very unique and interesting mechanic that's brand new with Isle of Madness. And I think there are some really good ones and maybe even some that are flying under the radar a bit. So I wanted to do a video specifically just talking about uh, the dual cards and the value that they potentially bring. So uh, each color essentially has a, a dual card, right? There's one for each of the five core attributes. There's one that is quote unquote dual colored. It's a sorcerer one. And then there is a, a neutral one as well. So um, right out of the gate here, we're going to start with cloak and dagger. And if I'm being entirely honest, uh, this one is one of my favorites, if not my favorite overall. Um, it is really good. I think it's one of the ones that might be flying a bit under the radar. The same way that Steel Scimitar for a very, very long time flew under the radar. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but but Charmer, but Derek, I see Steel Scimitar all the time in aggressive decks. That's not falling under the radar. But the truth is it took a long time for Steel Scimitar to really catch on. There were many, many times in the history of Legends where it was uh, almost entirely absent from the meta. And I think people started catching on that, you know, it's essentially a firebolt that goes face in many ways and it can help your creature survive. And there's a lot of utility in Steel Scimitar and that's why aggressive decks love it now. Cloak and Dagger is a Steel Scimitar that you can essentially split the stats for just one more Magicka. Now, one more Magicka is technically double the cost, sure, but going from one to two isn't that big of a deal when you factor things like it can trigger, you know, multiple abilities on something like Dragon Star Rider. Uh, it doesn't factor in that you can save the reach for when it matters more and or save the health for when it matters more. There are plenty of times where when I'm playing like mid Dagath, for example, uh, that I have equipped a Steel Scimitar just so my creature will survive the trade, even though I don't need the extra damage to kill whatever I'm attacking into, right? Like that is a scenario that sometimes comes up and Cloak and Dagger allows me to split those resources. Similarly, there's been times where I've equipped a Steel Scimitar to trade up into something. Maybe I'm trading into a Sorrow of Avenge just to clear it out of the way. And the health portion goes to waste on the Steel Scimitar as well. So by splitting your Steel Scimitar into two cards, essentially, you get a lot more versatility. And then, as is the case with all of these dual cards, you do get an extra card in your hand, which means that uh, cards that require you to discard, like Corner Club Gambler, for example, in mid Dagath, um, they're just easier to trigger on cards that might be uh, less than favorable or low impact at the time. So I'm a big fan of Cloak and Dagger. I think that it should see uh, a lot of play over time. I think, for example, Mid Dagath probably loves it. And there are maybe even arguments to be made about uh, trying to slot a couple into Mid Battle Mage, at least for testing. Um, item Battle Mage certainly wants to run the card. Uh, in, in Arena, I think it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> You get a lot of value in Arena for this being a common card. It is nuts. So I am a big, big fan of Cloak and Dagger, uh, the strength dual card. So next up, we're going to move to Intelligence, where we have Manic Jack and Manic Mutation. Um, I said Cloak and Dagger might be my favorite. If it's not, then Manic Jack is. After having played with this in Sorcerer, specifically a sorcerer that's also running like Wardcrafter, uh, running Lesser Ward, and running, um, you know, Royal Sage. Manic Jack is an unassuming 3-3 that can become a 7-7 in no time. He is a beast. Uh, I've been joking very frequently that Manic Jack is jacked. So big, big fan of this card because of the body. And then the Manic Mutation is also nice because... Even if you end up not using it on Manic Jack, you can really high roll with this sometimes. And for one Magicka, like that is a low cost to play, or excuse me, pay for potentially playing a very important keyword on a creature. Getting lethal at the right time can matter. Getting ward can definitely matter. Uh, getting charge. If you're playing this on a creature that just entered play, then you have a one in eight chance of getting charge. Um, 
I'm just a big fan of both of the cards. They generate a lot of value. And in that same like sorcerer deck that I was talking about where you're running lots of ways uh, to generate keywords, um, I was also running Gnarl Rootbender, and it turns out Manic Mutation on Gnarl Rootbender is also pretty good because you'll get to draw a card. So Manic Jack is, I think, uh, again, a lot of very, very good value. Uh, again, it's a common card, so very strong in Arena, in my opinion. Um, you, can, you can think of them as, like, worst case scenario, Manic Jack is a 4-4 four, four with a random keyword for 4, which is uh, not terrible, right? for a common, but um, just the versatility that the two cards provide, like separate from one another, I think is also a really important thing to factor in, and I'm a big fan. Uh, next up, we have Spawn Mother and uh, Baliwog. So Spawn Mother is interesting because it's a 1-1 one, one for four, but you get plus one, plus one for each other friendly creature, so... In something like, uh, you know, a token-based willpower deck, this can very easily be like a 4-cost 5-5. Five five. The fact that you also get another creature with it means that uh, you can potentially play this to, to buff this up. Uh, that being said, I think this one is uh, much lower on the power level than, say, Cloak and Dagger and Manic Jack uh, with the uh, mutation, simply because this is kind of a win more, right? This one is the sort of thing where you really have to have an established board to take advantage of Spawn Mother. And uh, unfortunately, our, our little tadpole friend here is just a 2-1 a for 2, which is not necessarily great. Now, the nice thing about this card is, uh, again, like all the ones we've covered thus far, it is a common. Uh, it's much better in Arena, just because uh, in Arena... The Baliwog is still a two drop and it helps you smooth out your curve, right? So even if you never get an impressive spawn mother, including this as just like a vanilla two drop with potential upside, uh, again, helps you to generate value. So this is an okay arena card. Um, I don't think it's good enough to make the cut in most token decks. And so unless there are future synergies that get printed or developed, um, this one is okay, but not as good as uh, the other two. And uh, then that takes us to Feldu and uh, the Elytra, Elytra Noble. I never know how to pronounce it, so my apologies. But uh, this is another one of those cards that I think is potentially underplayed. So the Noble at first glance seems okay, right? You're looking at this and you're probably thinking, why wouldn't I just run Clockwork Scorpion? You know, I get a 3-7 lethal with Drain for the same cost. And yeah, rightfully so, uh, you should consider that. But the fact that you also get Feldu, which allows tiny creatures to trade up very, very well, allows you to, like, surprise activate things like Archer's Gambit very well, um, means that, in all honesty, like, I could see an argument made for just running Feldu and then having this in your hand is an added bonus after the fact. Um, Feldu is very good on something, for example, like Thieves Guild Recruit that you're probably already running in your agility-based control deck anyway. So there is an argument to be made in the lethal-based control shells that Archer typically has uh, where you would want to run this card. Now, probably not running it as a three of, but as a one or a two of, right? I think it's entirely acceptable in that package. Um, again, common card. So worth mentioning, uh, I think it's very good in Arena because this is pseudo removal and that's always good in Arena. Uh, and this is just a big late game body. So by drafting this card, you get a late game card and removal. That seems pretty good to me, right? Um, Again, probably, in my opinion, not as strong as Cloak and Dagger and not as strong as Manic Jack, but I think this one is still borderline constructed playable in the right decks. So it should at least warrant some testing. Now, uh, next up is the Bollywog Tide Crawlers and the Smoked Bollywog Leg, and this is one that I actually think might be a bit under the radar. And the reason that I say that is because uh, this is a budget hive defender right it is a two six instead of a three six but it still has guard and it costs four but believe it or not there's an argument to be made that being a two six is actually better than being a three six with this card because it's in endurance 
And if you're running a 2-6 guard, you're probably trying to stall, which means you are likely running Necromancer, right? And if you're running Necromancer, then a 2-6 guard is something that you can resurrect, but a 3-6 guard is not, uh, at least without some, some tricks to buff your Necromancer. So um, I think this card is potentially cheeky fun. Uh, the Smoked Baliwag Leg, I think, is a great card for pitching, right? So if you're running like a scout deck that runs Necromancer, for example, um, you could pitch this to Corner Club Gambler, or you could just use it again to maybe make a trade with this and then heal. Um, the fact that it is in action means that if you were uh, looking to run uh, a more controlling sorcerer deck, not that I think it's necessarily like top tier constructed viable, it can be a lot of fun. Um, then in that scenario, uh, this is still something that you could use to target Gnarled Rootbender, for example. Now, the Rootbender would have to be damaged, but again, it's still an action that you can play yourself to target it and cycle and draw a card. But I think that the real benefit of this card, as I said, is this 2-6 body um, has some potential in Necromancer-based decks. So do I think that this is uh, like amazing? No, I don't think it's as good as Manic Jack. I don't think it's as good as Cloak and Dagger, but I think it's under the radar. I think that it warrants a, a bit more testing than what I've seen on the ladder thus far. And yeah, anyway, um, not bad. So next up we have the uh, the multicolored card, right? We have uh, Taviar and uh, Rayvat. So. Taviar here, I think, is the more powerful of the two. Uh, this is a 5 cost 3, 5 guard, but your opponent can't target other friendly creatures with actions. So this is interesting because it's very powerful against other control decks. But a 5 cost 3, 5 guard isn't very good unless you're playing your own control decks because the stats aren't going to help you like win the race, right? Like This is not something you want in a mid-range deck. Um, I would even still rather run Gatekeeper over this because at least that's a 6-6 six, six for 5. Um, so the effect is cool, but it's interesting because this is kind of a control card that is best against other control decks. Uh, meanwhile, we have uh, Rave at the Mage here. Uh, a 2-2 two, two ward for 4 is not great. Uh, it does give you ward, so I think this is good at trying to help you stall. And the fact that it is a 2-2 um, does potentially matter because, again, you could play this with Necromancer. And that means that after uh, this dies, you could re-summon it with Necromancer and keep kind of rewarding yourself, <laughs> pun intended, by uh, granting your face ward and, and protecting yourself from some damage. So, uh, again... In like a controlling sorcerer deck, maybe in a necromancer-based tribunal deck, uh, I think that this fits, but I, I don't think it belongs in mid-range sorcerer. And overall, I'm I'm generally underwhelmed by the card thus far. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying that for being a unique like legendary package. I mean, I mean, I know it's two creatures, right? But being a unique legendary. Um, you know, for the nine Magicka that you're investing in playing the, the two cards, you're not getting a ton of benefit out of it. So um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, time will tell. Again, I think right now controlling decks that run Necromancer are your best friend. Uh, and then the last one. This is the neutral dual card, and it's just uh, the Grumites. We have a Manic one and a Demented one. Uh, it's a three cost two, three. It's a three cost three, two. And... That's, that, I mean, that's it, right? So uh, if you're playing mono neutral and you just want bodies, sure, I guess. Um, if you're in arena, it's okay. It's a value generating card. Um, you get some vanilla creatures, but nothing to write home about. They, they can potentially help fill out your curve, give you some options. Um, not really constructed playable, borderline arena playable. If all of your other picks are garbage, then you can pick this up and feel pretty okay with it. But uh, I mean, it's, it's the neutral card, right? So uh, it's a common neutral that's just inherently giving you card advantage by being a dual card. You would expect this to be lackluster. In fact, if I'm being honest, 
the fact that this isn't like a pair of two twos as opposed to like what we get, which is a two three and a three two, I'm kind of shocked. It's more value than I would have even expected. So um, not great, but you know, not the end of the world either. And uh, anyway, that's it for the dual cards. I just wanted to go through them and talk about them. I think Cloak and Dagger and Manic Jack are fantastic. I think that they are very worthy of uh, certain constructed decks and that you should expect to see them quite a bit. Um, I think the Endurance one might sneak up on some people. And I think that the uh, Legendary is probably going to see play just because it's a unique legendary, but I think ultimately it might get weeded out of a lot of decks because like I said, personally for me, it's underwhelmed so far. Um, and I think that you'll see some Feldu in the Archer uh, control-based decks that are centered around lethal. So that that's it. If you are using any of them, let me know how. Let me know which ones you uh, I think are... You know, underperforming, overperforming, do you uh, agree with assessments? Have you seen cool, fun combos with them? I'm I'm really curious to see what the, the general feedback is on the dual cards, simply because it is a new mechanic, right? And they started small. They did not go overboard. They essentially gave us a bunch of commons, um, you know, with the exception of the legendary. So they started with a pretty small power level. And this is the kind of mechanic that could have a really big impact on the game. So I want to know what you guys think, how you're using them. And anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching. Until next time, may you walk on warm sands.